Mm. Wow. Turn that volume down a bit. Hey. Hey, sorry, I had my uh sound off. It's you again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you stalked me or something. <laughs> You're very active, so I know right. So active on there. Well, it's been I a while. The Same okay. Here. So I made, uh, to everyone watching, I made a minor uh, error in the, the title of the debate. It's into the European Monetary Union, the EMU, was specifically a discussion me and, and him have had. So a little bit of backstory, he has a master's degree and he is a professor of economics. Um, I am an economics student and... Uh, the foundations for mine is monetary economics and uh, specifically with the European uh, monetary system. So I'm going to start off and, and lay out what's called the Maastricht uh, Treaty, right? So before we can get into why it's wrong or why it's right, we're going to talk about what it takes to join into there. Um, so... What the EMU is, is uh, the management, uh, the design to support sustainable economic growth and high employment through appropriate economic and monetary policy making. Uh, and this is for all the countries that, that go through there. Okay, so for member states to join the economic monetary union, uh, they have to have convergence of member states economic policies and strengthening of cooperation between member states national central banks the coordination of monetary policies was institutionalized by the establishment of the european monetary institute whose task was to strengthen cooperation between the national central banks and to carry out the necessary preparations for the introduction of the single currency the national banks were to become independent during the stage now, um, what this debate is on is one, for a country to enter into the European Monetary Union, they have to meet the convergence criteria. And that convergence criteria is the crux of the debate. Yeah, so. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you talk because I gotta before I can define okay. that I've really gotta break it down. So where where this debate idea came from? Well, Joe wanted a debate, and a few days ago or last week, I was actually I was in Spain, so I couldn't I didn't really want to get too much into it, but I did go into it a little bit, and that was that you had posted on your Facebook page a question of why. I'd have to go back and look at it if you want to say the exact what exactly it was, but it was something along the lines: Why do European countries look really good when they have really high growth rates when they enter the EU, and then as soon or when they're looking to enter the EU, and then as soon as they get in the EU, all of that kind of flatlines? Correct. Yeah, that's that was the that was the crux of the argument that I'd made. Yeah, so or the question you had made, right? That was the the question you had posted as your yeah. original post. And then my contention is that EU nations cook the books and lie to f make the numbers look much better than they actually are. And then when they get into the EU, a lot of the, a lot of that stuff is exposed. And that's why they kind of flatline. So that before they enter the EU, yes, their numbers look good, but really it's just because they got some fancy Arthur Anderson type accounting it, along those lines and so they looked really good so that they could join the EU and then once they're in the EU they can't hide those anymore and so they kind of go back to reality that was my 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 contention and I had I had posted the Greek problem as yeah. kind of key to my to my point yeah okay so um just so everybody knows what what it takes to be a part of the European Union, the convergence criteria, which is really the crux of the debate, because what he says 
it could partially be right for some of these, but these countries have to get all four of these. Now it's price stability, which is your inflation rate has to be within 1.5% of the lowest inflation rate in the economic union. Uh, government finances, you cannot be running crazy deficits. I think it's anything over 80%. Um, you might want to fact check that because it, it changes uh, relatively often depending on what the country wants to do. Uh, 80% of GDP to debt ratio. Um, exchange rates, uh, you have to have converging con exchange rates and long-term interest rates have to be converging towards uh, a singular system as, as well. So the analysis that I've done and the analysis that others pe other people have done is that overall the convergence criteria um, is not a linear. Uh, it's not a, a linear model that can be built, right? So if you run a unit root test on it, it will always fail as a linear model, and it only passes as a nonlinear model. Now, the reason why that's important is because if you took all the data uh, at face value and laid it on a graph, there there is good reason to believe that all of these are converging to each other. Um, secondly. For the statement, for them to cook their books, they could do that with their governmental finances, which is only one of the criteria, but they still have to meet the other three criteria. And that's really where the inflation rate is not, is not independent of the other three. It has to be, there is interdependency between those three uh, uh, other objectives. So if a government's running these crazy high debt ratios like Greece, like Greece was doing, you're going to see problems in their inflation rate, which all of my analysis has shown they had serious problems with their inflation rate. They were the only ones uh, who failed both linear and nonlinear convergence to monetary policy to the euro and to Germany, which is considered the base for the European Union. And uh, uh, their long-term bonds were were garbage and that's where really where other countries noticed that they were not meeting the criteria and which is why the intervention for the european union happened um so that's that that's directly to the the, the greece argument um secondly the argument uh that i made was one of agglomeration your the european union should be an agglomeration and for those of you who don't know agglomeration is where companies and businesses tend to uh come together in a certain area because that certain area builds barriers from outside sources. It, it's, it's not a land barrier, but it's typically a human capital barrier. You can think of Silicon Valley, right? It's an agglomeration of all of these tech companies. So the European Union had, had uh, and the European Monetary Union had built itself so that it could be agglomeration. Now, pre-joining, there is agglomeration. But as soon as people join, the European Union has a serious drought when it comes to uh, people getting the edge otherwise that they would get from the technology boost from entering into that agglomeration. Yeah. So I think, I think countries have, like, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on the EU or anything, but I know countries have a, a significant reason incentive to try to join the EU and so they are incentivized to join at all costs because the EU uh, and the, the origination of the EU, it was sold as an economic union, but in reality, it's a, more of a political union. And so I think in many cases, the EU is willing to ignore a lot of its so-called standards for joining in order to get more countries in. And there have been politicians that have admitted that it is a political union. It's with the intent of bringing all these countries together for political purposes, not for economic purposes. So, um, yes, there are many standards for there are the four standards that Joe had mentioned for when EU nations join, they have to meet them. Uh, and <laughs> just keep going. Just, just yeah. <laughs> Don't let her touch it. <laughs> Exit out. Cool. So, 
So they have to join. And then once they're in, they have certain standards that they're supposed to meet. But again, the EU lets countries slide on those as well because it wants more countries in and it's afraid of losing countries. So I think there are a lot of political reasons why, for which the EU is perfectly willing to overlook certain things in order to get countries in. Now, it is a political union. It's not really an economic union. It, it is an economic union, but it's not. that's not the purpose of the EU. The purpose of the EU is, is for politics. Um, so as a general rule, I would say that you're right. But the problem is, is that when it comes to the European Monetary Union and the European Monetary Institute, um, really the European Monetary Institute, for the most part, is, is, is rather nonpartisan. It's, it's rather objective in what it does. Um, there are parts of the EU that are separate from politics, despite what people may think. Um, uh, same with, with uh, the UN. Uh, you know, there, there is political movements within it, but climate change, for instance, climate change from what the, the scientists at UN say is completely different than what the politicians who back the scientists say. So that's one statement that can be made. But all of these countries that enter into this when they when when they are read on the market right i do not agree that they can fool the market and the market forces now i base this off of what's called the efficient market hypothesis which states that the market will always have the right price signal whether or not we can understand it as as humans it has the right pri right price signal so there's nothing that ever goes wrong in 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 the prices and even if there is something that does go wrong, no amount of human modeling at this point can understand it. Now, with Greece and other countries coming into the European Union, they are, they are being looked at very, very significantly, uh, very critically, because for them to enter into the EU, they could very well, in fact, you know, cause issues for the EU in general by being a bad country. For instance, Greece, which uh, significantly worsened the European Monetary Union and the European Union in general after the financial crash and ended up forcing Europe into a double-dipped recession until quantitative easing came out in 2013 and, and um, smoothed out that monetary shock. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, so you mentioned the idea of the inability to fool markets or fool people. The um, uh, what was the phrase you used? It's the Chicago schools uh, efficient uh, that, market, uh, efficient market policy. Yeah, efficient market idea or thesis. Or so that's the idea that bubbles don't exist. And so I, you know, I don't really think that. I think for the most part, yes, but I don't. I do think that there are bubbles and that people can be fooled and many times. And so what I had posted was several articles. There's a whole lot of articles that talk about how mad. Well, in this one I'm looking at now how quote magic unquote made Greek debt disappear before it joined the, e the European union or the Euro. And so yes, um, I, I think that their countries are able to fool markets, especially if certain people are not looking at it as closely because they want to overlook certain ideas, certain supposed requirements in order to get more countries into the EU. Uh, I think they wanted, to, they've been trying to get Turkey in, right? The, but they see the problem with Turkey is that Turkey is a Muslim nation. And of course, now I think it's even more difficult to get Turkey in because of the the hordes of people that have flooded into Turkey and, and they're afraid that they're going to flood into Europe. So, so I, so I think they've overlooked a lot of issues with Turkey with the idea of trying to get Turkey into the EU. To some extent, but see, Turkey has more what you would consider political <clears throat> issues, whereas it, the, the economic issues for Turkey are, 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 are rather limited versus what you suspect of Greek of Greece. But here's the thing. Greece, if, if you're going to go out and cook the books for a country to come in, I don't think the country that I would want to come in would be Greece. 
It's not it's not significantly powerful. It has little to no market value outside of some natural resources like olives and things of that nature. Um, First of all, Greece is my second favorite country in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you should probably pick a better one. Um, yeah, they have the best right olives, the Serbia. best cheese, and the best yogurt, too. No, no, Why? no. It's right beside Serbia, and Serbia is much more beautiful. Um, I don't know. I've been, to, I've been to Greece twice. I've been to Turkey once, just on a, just for one day, though, island, island hopping. But <clears throat> So I think, again, the issue with Greece is that they are – they are part of Europe and they're trying to get the entire European block in there. And I think this goes more into a global scheme, if you will, which I don't want to get too much into that, but I would say the European, they're trying to reestablish Europe as its own political power on the earth. Um, you know, when they, when they formed the EU, they were talking about forming the EU to where it was big enough to rival the United States, right? Yeah. 350, 450 million people in the EU right now. And the more countries they get, the bigger and more politically and economically powerful they can be to rival the United States. And so I think that Greece, they they wanted Greece in there as, I guess, being a, a large landmass. And, it, you know, Greece is actually an important, I would think Greece would be an important um, in terms of its place in the Mediterranean Sea being right there next to Turkey and, and on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, sort of. I'm sure so, at, one without... point in time, at one point in time, it was far more important than it is now. <clears throat> even, even as a trading host and a trading hub, it's really not that special. I think militarily, I don't, I don't know, but well, I'm not a military expert. <laughs> and I haven't read anything about that. But. I, I, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever met a Greek soldier, personally. <laughs> um, so one of the things about cooking the books that I want to go back to, so let, let's go back to the inflation rate. Inflation rate is not independent of a government's uh, budget. So there, there is interdependency right there. So Greece's inflation rate is typically higher by two to three percent than just about everybody else in the union. And, and they've kind of gotten away with it purely because it was like, whatever but the thing is is the higher your inflation rate is the less likely you're going to have budget deficits um and and that's purely because there's just more money in the system this money can pay off that debt uh the money itself is not worth as much so unless you're spending so much more than what you're getting out i mean it, it's rather impossible if you maintain even even a normal nominal budget deficit at a repeated rate right your inflation rate will still chop into it and that, that didn't happen and that was one of the things was their finances were were messed up but you can look at the inflation rate and go wow there is a problem during this time during the financial crisis they had a huge dump a lot of countries did but them more so than others into their nominal gross domestic product now, when you do that, that's directly linked with your uh, with your inflation rate, and that's what really caused the teeter totter over the edge for for Greece's uh, you know money troubles. So, outside looking in, independent companies can and do run inflation tests for countries. They can look at harmonized uh, consumer price index, consumer price index, uh, uh, GDP deflator, and typically, no matter what uh, metric they use, they're usually within uh, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2% of what the uh, inflation rate given by the government statistics. So I just don't see that they're cooking the books enough based on inside and outside statistics to the point that they lied and cheated their way into the EU or that the EU wouldn't have noticed and at least uh, used some type of pressure on them to, to normalize their economy. 
which is something nobody's going to talk about because they do that. They force economies through the convergence criteria down into a certain sector so they don't have these problems. Well, what I understand is that I think you're allowed, what, a 3% inflation rate as part of the EU currency it's country, correct? 1.5% from the lowest. So if the lowest... I mean, once you're in, though? Yeah, but to get in, it's 1.5. And typically, I think I think you're given an extra half a percent. So it's 2% from the lowest. The lowest is typically, um, I think it's Germany, most likely, just because they're the benchmark for most inflation uh, yeah. in, in the European Union. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if... And if Greece, I think Greece has been cheating on that for the last several... Well, I don't know about now, but I... Last time I saw it, they had been cheating on that by a few percent for a, quite some time. Well, see, you you say that, but no independent study can confirm that. And I've, I've looked. No independent study can confirm that. Google, Amazon, these other these other independent agencies within Greece itself have all said Greece's inflation rate was within 0.1, 0.2% of what the government statistics are. And that's, that's, that's the same through every country uh, because it's too easy to pick up on uh, disinflation, hyperinflation, deflation. The market will immediately point that out and whoever's in the market will get those signals and they will be able to run a quick analysis on it. It does not take long. I can do a state-by-state -state analysis on Amazon through a statistical program in I'm in 30 minutes and give you the inflation rate based on CPI. Now to different baskets, it, it might be a little bit different, but based on CPI uh, within 30 minutes per state. Okay. I'm trying to get there. Just, uh, what their inflation rate is. Well, right now it's pretty, officially it's pretty low. But what I'd read several years ago is that I think it was Greece had been up around 4 or 5%. And the EU doesn't like that. They had admonished them for being above um, where they wanted to be or where they're supposed to be. So, it is, But it basically, it is possible for a country within the European Union to inflate their current, inflate more so than the officially allowable level. Yes. Um, but back to my... They can, mm -hmm. but it's they, they get pressure put on them. Right. On they, they're, they're pressured. Forces their inflation rate down anyway. It's, it's well, I know Greece had a 15% 15, 15 bond rate during the peak of their crisis just a few years ago. Uh, so 15 to 18%, I think. Here's all the, uh, from 2000, uh, <clears throat> as per uh, monthly rate of inflation change, uh, they've averaged, would you stop for just a second? I gotta run this analysis. <laughs> So, by the way, it looks like Greece joined the European Union in 1981, and they joined the economic, the, mon the monetary union, the euro, in 2002. And I think what actually broke, Greece had lots of problems, but the straw or the stick that broke the Greek back was actually, this is maybe another topic, but was the Olymp hosting the Olympics that collapsed their economy for a, a small country like them they actually have a gdp the size of washington state i believe and they spent something like 10 billion dollars to host the olympics and we all know what happens when you host the olympics um economic problems are soon to come but that's a little bit of a side note so anyways it's, so the title of this one is how goldman sachs helped greece to mask its true debt and it helped the greek government mask the true extent of its deficit with the help of derivatives deal that legally circumvented the eu Maastricht deficit rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At some point, the so-called gross currency swaps will mature and swell the country's already bloated deficit. So that's mainly what I was getting at is that. Yeah, I understand that. Greek I, I is one specific example. 
Greek is one, Greece is one specific example, but there, I think they're one example that came to light. And so I think the incentive here is for countries who want to join the union and a reason, reasons here, European Union, why do countries want to join? They have eight answers here. Peace, because, you know, they're not going to fight once the, when they're in the union. Economic growth, European Union membership means you can suck off Germany and that, possibly that, Great Britain. <laughs> right, but, it, that, but it's not working. So that, that was the point I was driving home is that it's not working. They're not gaining growth. They're not really getting peace right. either. Um, real quick, just so you know. From the year 2000, a month-by-month -month change in G, or, uh, in the inflation rate for Greece as an average is negative 0.94545 based on uh, the data from Eurostat.eu. And that's my own analysis, a part of my paper that should be published by the end of the summer to uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. So we'll see. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, I, um, I do see that over the last year, it's about a zero average. Yeah. They had some deflation and then inflation. But yeah, so as far as joining, there's, you know, freedom to travel. You can go within the EU, no problem. Kind of like with, the whole idea was to turn it into, again, the United States. There's a lot of other reasons um, they don't get into in here. But the, so... I think a lot of countries are incentivized to join and in order to join you need to meet the minimum standards that you had mentioned and so countries are willing to do whatever it takes to join it's kind of like in, when you, you do go to an interview right you you tend to bloat your stats maybe cook up your resume just a little bit just to get you in and i think that there there are similar aspects with joining the eu and so i, I had repeat myself, but, but uh, I had simply pointed to Greece as an example, as a clear example of how that had happened and, this, and a well shown example. Right. But the thing is, is one that Greece's issue with its derivatives and cooking the books there has nothing to do with whether the growth rate went up or down because for them it did, but they're part of <clears> the original <throat> sets. It's all of these incoming countries that are having the issue. So they're having, three, four, five percent uh, uh, GDP growth. And then the moment they hit uh, the EU, they're getting one to negative one percent. So it, it, it's a give or take of one percent. Uh, and we're talking about because you can be part of the European Union. Uh, this is for but both. not part of the monetary. Yeah, union, right. This right? is for both. And joining the monetary union is like that final step sort of. Right. And the, the reason why I bring up that. I bring up the monetary union specifically for the, the the statement on Greece because Greece is part of both. Uh, that that was right. the reason the European Monetary Union was brought in, and, but yeah, and that's and that's basically what we're specifically talking about, anyways. Right. So, so, but when it, when it comes to the EU, and this goes back to the question we've had the other day, is that there's no growth. These countries they're joining and they're getting nothing out of it. Uh, uh, some people are saying that it's uh, domestic fiscal policy when they join, you know, they're, they start doing austerity, which somehow or another depletes growth, which is completely un unfounded on anything. Uh, they're stating that there is, uh, there is labor market failures. Uh, so you would think when you open up a new company, uh, labor from the rest of the European Union would flock to your area. And that since the European Union is built the way it is, they would have like little to no language barriers. But ultimately what they're finding out is that when these countries join, they're doing awful. Um, and it's not because they're cooking the books and it's not because there's problems with the Euro European Monetary Institute or the European Monetary Union, which even if you are part of the EU, you are still part of the convergence criteria. You're, you're part of stage one treaty. You still have to work towards the stage two treaty and the stage three treaty. So as soon as you join the European Union, you are told, hey, you start working on your convergence criteria so you can join the European Monetary Union, so you can be a part of the so we can get this under the, uh, 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 so we can get this down. Because um, there's only 19 of the, 32 countries 
in from from the European Union in the European Monetary Union, but they're all leading to at least two or three of the convergence criteria that I pointed out earlier, the, those other four. So that's the that's the that's the relationship between those two. Yeah, so I, w I will say that I think the European Union, it's got a, a lot of other problems. The whole idea that you're going to put Spain, France, Germany, and all these countries that have been at war for their entire history together, don't speak the same language, don't have the same culture. It's not like, it's not really like the United States where we all speak English and have a similar cultural background. And European Union has many, 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 many different problems. And this is just, I think, one of them. But yeah, I don't think that countries are really going to get the kind of economic growth that they might have expected when they joined the EU. And I would estimate that a lot of countries in the EU join because they think they can absorb the benefits of, of the growth of Germany and some of the other countries. I don't know what they're going to do now that Britain is, com if Britain gets completely out. I think well, the European Union is going to. Well, there's the second. I know they're not issue. part of the monetary union, but there's the secondary issue if Marine Le Pen wins, which last I checked, she had a huge boost in polls after uh, she got That's second place in the runoff. Well, she got second That's place. Or yeah. Um, I don't see her winning, uh, but I do see Brexit happening, and I do see other countries starting to get ready to pull out of the European Union, which is why I did that analysis, uh, because I do think that there would be... Down to 10? Yeah. I think there would be... Down to 10? What? That was some of the... Uh, when, it was, when it was created, people thought it would be the... There would be 10 of them. Yeah. Right? The 10-headed uh, beast, but that's another issue. Oh, yeah. So just no, a, a little side comment. It's it's a it's a giant beast of stupidity that should have never happened. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I, I I cannot find any legitimate economic argument for a, 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 that size of a union. Even even the United States. I actually oppose the United States being fifty states. I think it should be split up into at least six territories. Um, it's actually not far from some of the Austrians I've heard. Uh, it's zero, it's zero territories, actually. I think a lot, most Austrians are libertarian, so they would say zero, basically just be one giant territory of independent people. But that's, an, yeah. Well, I mean, there, Murray Rothbard had stated that for America to flourish under the system we were in, that we would need to... Um, split the U.S. into six different countries with six different sovereign uh, national monies. That way we would have currency competition. Uh, it would drive trade that wouldn't be as uh, like America, for instance, 50 percent of our trade is intra in industry, intra industry. Right. Um, it would actually it would actually boost that. And uh, the thing about intra-industry, right? So if you have comparative advantage trade, one side typically is going to get a better deal than the other side. Even if both are, are going to be better in the long run, there's going to be some losers. Um, whereas intra-industry, there's no losers. So uh, making the market smaller and more competitive for America would – you know, boost it. And you can apply that same logic to uh, Europe. Europe did what it did, did what it did because it was having serious problems dealing with war debt and things of that nature. And they thought that agglomeration was going to be a much, much bigger part of Europe. It was going to move toward a single language and, and it was going to culturally homogenize. And ultimately they were absolutely wrong when everyone told them they're not going to meet that criteria. And it's not going to work. Yeah, and a lot of what actually what ends up happening is when they get these Eastern European, which are relatively poor, to join the EU, just the EU, a lot of a lot of their those Eastern European countries people will move to Western Europe for work, and even 
for instance, when I was even in Greece, most people in the shops work very hard. They're not Greek, though. Right. Um, they're like from Poland or from somewhere. And you get that in a lot of countries. When I was in Italy long, about 10 years ago, you get a lot of... Um, so no, where were we? no, we were in London. <laughs> and, and we have, you get a lot of people from Italy and from outside, from Eastern Europe that are in poor countries and they come to the richer countries for work and for help. And so you, I, you get a lot of, you don't really get, um, I think th that's why those countries want to join the EU is they want their people to leave. They want a lot of their citizens to go off and make money in a wealthier nation and joining the EU allows you to do that. Now, I don't think that's necessarily beneficial for the Western countries such as Germany and Great Britain to have these relatively poor immigrants from other countries that are just now they're migrants. Right. Well, right. I mean, that's that's always an odd thing, because then you have like then you really have like uh, that movement of labor trying to move labor to capital. By moving from a labor intensive area to a capital intensive area and trying to do labor intensive jobs in a capital intensive environment like that, that to me is just not uh, a good idea in the short run or the long run. It's much better to just use, uh, you know, factor, uh, trade factorization, uh, capital factorization than it would be to move labor. I mean, one of the big issues I've always had with demand side uh, trade is it's inference of uh, moving labor from place to place, whereas capital is actually much easier to move than labor um, because I can take a I can take a plant, move a plant to somewhere. Whereas uh, you can't take There's no family left behind, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just take people and move them and and throw them in a whole new cultural, this is social setting, teach them a new job while they're trying to survive, and somehow make it work. Despite what many people think about Mexicans coming into the U.S., it's actually an extremely hard problem, uh, and it no. does it does bring up higher levels of uh, poverty than they would have had in Mexico. Which is why we're seeing a huge decline in in Mexican immigration into the United States. Because, I mean, would you move here to be in poverty, or would you stay down there and be in uh, lower middle class when their their GDP per capita is, I think it's twenty six thousand, whereas America's something like forty five thousand. Like, sure, they're we double them, but if you're working here for five dollars an hour, picking apples versus getting a factory job making four dollars an hour but you're at their price level versus ours i mean you're gonna you're gonna do better in the long run staying in your own country um, yeah and i think the, the big issue is the family issue and the the social cost of having yeah. them come up or yeah. you're leaving your family to come live with seven other people in a small hut or something so <laughs> Uh, I know as far as the monetary union, that's also a problem for a lot of these countries. Like when you're, when they created the monetary union, Germans lost, I think, one third to two thirds of their wealth by joining the EU. So insurance policies, bank accounts, all these things, when they transferred from the mark to the euro, a lot of Germans lost massive amounts of wealth. Uh, and a lot of that wealth was transferred over to the poor countries that joined. And so imagine if the U.S., they, they had, there was a lot of talk about the Amero several years ago, and you probably remember that, the Amero. No, I don't. There's a lot of talk about it. So there's a lot of talk about the Amero Stop. several years ago, the idea that you would have a euro for America. It would be Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And if that were to happen, you could see if all three currencies went on par, then it would at some time, then you could do it at that point. But the fact is that Canada, United States, and Mexico currencies are not on par. Canada is, you know, Americans, the U.S. dollar is the strongest currency by by far. I mean, it's about 25% over the Canadian, and it's, what, it's like 21 
pesos to the dollar. So if we went on something like an Amero, the Americans would lose a lot of their yeah of their purchasing power. Their your bank accounts would shrink by probably fifty percent or so, and your you know, everything you've worked your whole life for. So imagine that's exactly what happened in Germany, and that's why Britain stayed off. So Great Britain, when I was there ten years ago, it was two point one to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's only 1.3 or so, but it's still vastly better than the euro. Oh yeah! And by staying out of the euro, they've been they've been able to keep on an economic stronghold of their own currency, a high purchasing power. Yeah. And so, but by joining the monetary union, yeah, they've really just kind of taken these muddy waters and they've just blended them into one big pool. And there were winners and there were losers, but. The strong nations were definitely the losers. And so these poor nations that came in and joined the, the, the European Monetary Union were able to gain quite a bit of economic strength in there by joining, but at the expense of others. So. Right. Well, I guess back to the point that we were talking about now, these Western countries, since they're that that's a that's a hypothesis, is that since these Western countries have to deal with these constant losses by these countries joining into the European no. Union, they're not helping them, which is why when they get into the European no. Union, they're not getting those levels of agglomeration. They're not getting increases in GDP like they were. They're not getting uh, higher levels of uh, direct foreign investment. Um, they're, they're doing worse, whereas it's almost to the idea that maybe countries like Germany, uh, France are bringing in these countries by giving them some uh, foreign direct investment. And then when they get into the union and they realize that they're, that, that they're not gonna do as well as they thought, they just strip it out. But you know, that's, that's kind of an odd idea as to whether or not that could even be a legitimate statement because direct foreign investment wouldn't be something that the government's promoting. It would be direct foreign investment from companies themselves, um, multinationals. And I don't see them going, well, I love Germany, therefore I'm not going to go to uh, Czechoslovakia, right? I don't, uh, there's definitely, there's definitely the idea that it's the East Bloc of Europe, which has significantly been worse than anything, any distributive, distributive error in the world, right? So we talk about gender pay gap, we talk about, uh, the white versus black pay gap, the Asian versus black pay gap in America. None of those hold a candle to West versus East pay, pay gap, like as a total of living. So France. That's the communist. Right. Yeah. Having been a member of the communist bloc versus the Western bloc. So yeah, East Germany versus West Germany being two, everything, everything's the exact same thing. Same. Culture, language, geography, demography, everything's the same. One difference, one's communist, one's not. Well, there's even there's still even a problem. I mean, they broke down the wall when and East Germany still has nine percent unemployment rate. Like as a whole, everybody on the eastern side still has nine percent. And anytime yeah, well, I was huh? I was gonna say anytime they, they have like any minor stochastic shock to it it's just it just explodes it just goes straight out the roof they don't have any competitive edge over west germany i mean it's it's really such a vast difference between the two and it's, yeah. and that, that communist communist era ideologies and ideas and the influence that communism has had when you when you're under that kind of tyranny right and oppression for such a long time i think that it tends to last. It's not something you can really get rid of. You look at Russia today, it's still a very depressed society. And it's because we, we run a communism for almost 100 years. I mean, you had entire generations that never saw anything but the communist tyranny. And, you know, they really try to stamp out religion and belief and individualism. And, and it's hard to get out of. Yeah. So even if you come in and you give people money and opportunity, they're like, eh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Or not really interested. <laughs> right. Well, we got 30 seconds left. So last yeah. thing I'm going to say, the entrance into the EU is a legitimate task for countries because of the convergence criteria. 
Um, and really, there's not a whole lot on this debate. This was just a, a strong discussion, and I had fun. Yeah, well, it was great. So I'll, I'll post one of those articles just for fun, the Greek articles. All right. So take care, Joe. Have a good one. Have a good one. Nice talking.